Welcome once again. Um, it's my pleasure to have this opportunity to talk to you about the discovery of the Higgs boson at BLHC. I have put a question mark there and the uh, reason for that uh, hopefully will become apparent towards the end of the talk. Um, so let's get started. As you know, uh, the Nobel Prize in Physics for 2013 was shared by Francois Angler and uh, Peter Higgs. Uh, these two are uh, among actually a larger number of people who roughly 50 uh, years ago had postulated the existence of a uh, Higgs field. Well, actually, they didn't call it Higgs field back then. They <laughs> called it differently. Uh, even Higgs himself didn't call it the Higgs field. Uh, but another uh, famous physicist who had already won the Nobel Prize by then by the name of Steven Weinberg uh, called it the Higgs field for reasons that he himself later uh, disputed. <laughs> anyway, uh, the name caught on. Um, the, they shared the Nobel Prize for the theoretical discovery of the mechanism that contributes to our understanding of the origin of mass. Uh, of subatomic particles. And however, they had to wait all these 50 years um, because the Nobel Prize could not be uh, awarded without actual experimental verification that their theory was indeed correct. And that uh, experimental verification, the experimental, um, the actual observation and discovery was announced on the 4th of July uh, 2012. And that resulted in the uh, awarding of the Nobel Prize. So I'm an experimenter uh, that was a, a member of the teams, actually two teams that jointly announced the discovery. And we share uh, the pride and uh, glory with these uh, theorists who uh, received the prize. And if you go to the, um, you know, Google the thing and look at the announcement, uh, they too acknowledge the importance of the experimental endeavor that uh, brought a, the story to its successful end so far. So uh, as you can see here, um, it says was confirmed um, through the discovery of the predicted fundamental particle, the ATLAS and CMS experiments at CERN's Large Hadron Collider. and. Uh, I'm a member of the Atlas group. We have a, a whole team here of physicists at NIU uh, that I'm working with. So um, to put the matter in context, uh, what are the most fundamental questions that we ask about the workings of nature? And these questions have been asked throughout the history of human civilization uh, across cultures and across the world. Uh, very natural things. What is the world made of? And uh, these questions have, the answers have changed over time. Uh, what is it that holds all these things together? Whatever it is made of, uh, they're held together rather than being uh, dispersed throughout space. How did it all start? Was it always like this or did it start uh, in a different state and has evolved to the present state? What does the future hold? If we keep going the way it has evolved, where might we be headed? And what or who else is out there? Out there meaning outside of our uh, immediate reach of our sight or other senses. So perhaps in outer space, uh, and as particle physicists, we try to answer some of these questions. To put it in a, uh, put a bit more dramatic spin on it, quoting one of our more famous colleagues, um, what is it that breathes fire into the equations and makes a universe for them to describe? Why does the universe go to all the bother of existing? Uh, this may sound witty or funny, but it's actually quite profound. You can write down a set of equations that are internally consistent. They're all fine. 
And you can write down many such sets of equations. What is so special about this particular set of equations that it has a real universe to obey that set of equations? There are numerous other sets of equations to which we don't have a corresponding universe. So that's also a pretty fundamental question, not just metaphysical, but quite physical. So um, to get an understanding of what we are made of, we try to go look deeper and deeper into the structure of matter. And in that process, what we have found so far, let's start with something that is quite small, like a dewdrop, has a diameter of about a millimeter or so, pretty small. But we know that it is made up of smaller things, namely water molecules, right? Water molecules, sorry, um, which has a diameter much, much smaller, even less than a millionth of a millimeter is, again, not fundamental, but is made up of two hydrogen atoms and an oxygen atom. The hydrogen atom actually turns out to be the simplest of all atoms. And we now know that the hydrogen atom itself consists of a nucleus, like any other atom, and some um, electrons orbiting about that. The hydrogen atom's nucleus is the simplest of all, consisting of a single proton. And we even know that the proton itself is not fundamental. Even that has substructures. Namely, it is made up of two up quarks and a down quark. And now we are talking about 10 to the power minus 12 millimeters. We didn't stop there. We probed even further, went down another three orders of magnitude. Now we are talking about 10 to the power minus 15 millimeters, or 10 to the power minus 18 meters. We hear a lot about um, nano science these days. That means nanometer, a billionth of one meter. Here we are talking about a billionth of that yet. So a billionth of a billionth of a meter, we have been able to probe nature down to that distance scale. And so far, uh, we have not found any substructure to the quark. So as far as we can tell, the quark itself is a fundamental particle without any substructure. And so is the electron that goes around the hydrogen atom. And everything that we see, you and I and the screen and the laptop and the floor and the sun, are made up of these nuclei and electrons. So I just refer to the sun. What do these small uh, particles make up? Let's look at the largest structures that we can go to. Starting with the Earth, which is some 12,000, closer to 13,000 kilometers in diameter. That's pretty large. The dewdrop was small. Our starting point, the Earth, is large. But the solar system which is some 11 billion or closer to 12 billion kilometers across, the Earth is a rather small object. The solar system itself, uh, here shown by the sun, is actually a average or even slightly below average star if you look at all the stars around us. And here the sun is shown in it, among its nearest neighbors, a bunch of other stars shown here, we are now talking about some 200 trillion kilometers across. If we keep going like that, almost a billion, billion kilometers across is our galaxy, namely the Milky Way, and the, our sun, whoop, uh, our sun here is actually like a an average house in, the, in one of the outer um, suburbs of this um, galaxy, if you think of it as a um, large city right there. And our galaxy is one of many, many galaxies. Um, thankfully, our ga galaxy is actually slightly above average in size. But just the Milky Way galaxy contains an estimated 100 billion stars, the average of which is actually a little bigger than our sun. Gives us an idea of how tiny we are in that uh, scale. 
but it doesn't stop yet. The galaxies themselves, um, thousands or hundreds of thousands of galaxies form the so-called galactic groups. And here, I will not bother uh, counting the zeros here. You can just see that there are a lot of zeros before the kilometer here. We are talking about uh, millions of light years now. So here we see some of the nearest uh, galaxy groups here. A uh, summary of the structure, the largest uh, structure of the universe that we know here. And this picture actually shows some of the farthest objects that we have been able to see so far using our most powerful telescopes. And some of these um, stars here are approximately, they're more than 10 billion light years away. Our whole universe is only 13.7 billion years old. So light that we are seeing today from these stars took close to 13 billion years to travel to our eyes. These are actually the stars shortly after the birth of the universe. Think about it. It's like if light traveled so slowly that it took, uh, let's say I'm 20 years old. I'm actually a little older than that, but let's pretend. <laughs> if light traveled so slowly that it took 20 years to travel from my toes to my eyes, this is like I'm looking at my toe and I'm seeing as it was when I was just born. We are actually literally looking at another part of the universe as it was shortly after its birth. And this is an artist's impression of what uh, the universe today may uh, look like. This is only the small part that we see today, but it's, um, well, very large it, as it is. It's a tiny pixel in this um, big scheme of things. And this is one of my favorite pictures. This is a um, picture of a part of the sky taken by the Hubble Ultra Deep Field Telescope in the visual uh, wavelengths. Guess what these objects are that we are seeing on the screen? Except for a, just a few, like this one here and this one here, this and uh, this, those are stars, like our sun. Every other object that, that's a little smeared here is actually a galaxy containing tens and hundreds of billions of stars like our sun. So these are extremely distant galaxies. With our bare eyes, we won't be able to resolve individual stars in those galaxies. But each of these objects here, this one is a galaxy, the galaxy, and even the tiny ones here, each of them is a galaxy with hundreds, um, tens and hundred billion stars. And guess what, how much of the sky this represents? If I stretch my arm at full length and stick out my thumb, this is how much is blocked out by my thumbnail. So imagine, this is only a very small part of the entire sky, and that has this much mass in it. So how much does the entire sky have? It boggles the mind, doesn't it? So what's the connection between this and the subatomic world that um, we are probing with high energy physics? Actually, it's very deep. You have to have a good understanding of the subatomic to be able to explain this. Because with the slightest change, in the description of the subatomic world, its implications to the largest scale would be completely different. So whatever theory we work out have to be consistent with this picture. So the largest structures, our knowledge of the largest structures and our theories about the smallest ingredients have a very deep connection. They absolutely have to be compatible with each other. There's no wiggle room there. So, to uh, look at the history of the universe, which is another question that we ask, where did we come from? How did it all start? We, it's pretty widely accepted now that the universe started with a Big Bang. All experimental uh, observations point very strongly to that. And this is our world today. It says today, here. It's a pretty um, lumpy, sparse universe, cold. Uh, 
um, compared to what it was earlier. So now what do we have? Things are, matter is very clumped. There's the star, here's the earth, there's the moon. There's not much in between. It's mostly empty space. And that empty space is very cold. It wasn't like that before. If you keep going back billions of years, it was a hotter, denser, and less clumpy universe. Going back can be done in terms of time, obviously, uh, going back in years. Note that this is a highly nonlinear scale right here. Here we are at about 14 billion years today, and pretty um, soon we are down to less than a million years. Here we are talking about 100 seconds, and then we are going down in fractions of seconds. Here already we are talking about one-tenth of a billionth of a second. And that's about how far uh, we have been able to probe today. What we are trying to do at these high energy colliders, like the Large Hadron Collider at uh, CERN, is collide particles, in this particular case protons, head on to at extremely high energies. When we do that, momentarily it creates, uh, in, in a very confined space, it creates conditions that were very similar to a very early universe. How early? We can create uh, or uh, simulate conditions of the universe as it was one-tenth of a billionth of a second after Big Bang. And you may ask, so why? Actually, at Fermilab, before the uh, Large Hadron Collider turned on, the highest energy accelerator was right uh, in our backyard at Fermilab called the Tavatron. And that already went to less than a billionth of a second. And then all these uh, tens of nations spent billions of dollars and you know, thousands of scientists spent decades to build and operate this Large Hadron Collider that took us only a uh, factor of three or four so far closer to Big Bang. Why? And that's the interesting part. Not much happens in a billionth of a second these days. In fact, not much seems to happen over a lifetime. But as you go early in the universe, things were changing really rapidly. A tenth of a billionth of a second is huge. I mean, it makes so much change. It completely, uh, especially here, as you can see, this inflation happened 10 to the power minus 37th second. What is that? That's like a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. Very dramatic changes. It just goes to show that time as we perceive it today is not the right um, scale, uh, a right quantity to think about close to the Big Bang. Other ways of thinking about it is temperature. As I said, today we live in a cold universe. I mean, obviously it's cold outside, but that's nothing. The cold I'm talking about is the cold in outer space. The temperature of outer space today, we like to think it's, uh, or you know, common perception is it is absolute zero, that is zero degree Kelvin, not Fahrenheit or Celsius, but the coldest possible temperature is about minus 273 degrees uh, Celsius or minus 452 degrees Fahrenheit. That's cold. Um, but actually it's not quite absolute zero. There is some remnant radiation from early universe that keeps the temperature slightly above zero namely at 2.7 degrees Kelvin. Uh, so that's the cold universe of today. If we keep going back, the temperature quickly picks up. And already within a um, close to a million years, the temperature of the universe was 1,000 degrees Kelvin. That's hot. I mean, that would have vaporized us. And going back, we can talk about uh, high temperatures, these are unimaginable temperatures. Temperatures like this do not exist in today's universe anymore, nowhere. You can equivalently uh, count the age of the universe in terms of energy, which is shown here, and that's what corresponds to the energies of these particle collisions that are happening at the Large Hadron Collider today, or was happening uh, at Fermilab till about a couple of years ago. It shut down at that point. It was shut down because uh, the baton had passed to the Large Hadron Collider. So uh, by going back, we see that uh, back then, the universe had these free quarks and uh, leptons and other things 
that we don't see today anymore because they got into bound states. So what instruments do we use to uh, study the structure, these structures of the universe? Our eyes are designed to see the objects that makes um, most difference to us on an everyday basis like a, another human being or a car or a dog. Uh, tiny uh, electrons or very large galaxies we don't have to see with our eyes every day so it's not surprising that uh, our eyes are not best suited to see those. For those we designed a special instruments to see something as small as a cell. We have optical microscope to go to smaller um, things like a DNA strand or an atom. Uh, well, DNA strand, we have electron microscopes. And then we need uh, particle accelerators and colliders to see the smaller objects like an atom or a nucleus or the quarks. Going in on the other side, we use telescopes. Telescopes can be optical telescopes that use visible light, but there are other kinds of lights that we cannot see with our eyes like radio telescopes or x-ray telescopes um, or these days even uh, neutrino telescopes. So these are the instruments that we use to see the structures that uh, some of whose examples I've shown you already. And what we have learned by using uh, these things, especially the accelerators, is the most fundamental building blocks of everything around us and how they interact with each other. It turns out that the matter particles, sorry, um, are arranged in these three families marked here by one, two, three families or generations that are identical in e each uh, generation. We have these four particles, two types of quarks and two types of leptons. Um, two up quarks and a down quark make up a proton. Two down quarks and an up quark make up a neutron. And protons and neutrons together make up uh, nuclei of various elements that we see. Going around them are the electrons that we have all heard about. Neutrinos are things that are rather ghostly. They are not bound to any material. They zip through the universe and they interact so weakly, they are actually passing through us by the thousands every second without us feeling any effect of it. Um, if I pumped a billion neutrinos down, vertically downward, all but a few of them will emerge through Australia or China, whatever is on the other side of the earth, completely unscathed. The whole uh, thousands of kilometers of earth is transparent to it as glass is to light. How do we know that they even exist? Well, a very few of them will very rarely interact and we have um, seen those interactions, so it's experimentally verified. To make things interesting, that uh, structure of um, quarks and leptons is replicated two more times. And they're exactly the same from generation to generation, except the successively higher generation particles are a little heavier than the previous generation. So charm quark is just a little heavier up quark, and the top quark is slightly heavier charm quark, not slightly, a lot heavier, but from generation to generation only mass changes. Everything, all other properties like electric charge and uh, spin, etc., remain exactly the same. And that is where um, a question goes up, how are these differences in masses accounted for? Where does mass come from? And we haven't addressed that yet. In the last column here, these are the force carriers. So when two particles interact, like how is the uh, electron held in orbit about the nucleus? By electromagnetic force. That electromagnetic force is mediated by photons. What are photons? Photon is a quantum of light. So it's because of photons that we are able to see things. This um, projector is throwing photons at the screen, the bouncing off the screen, hitting our eyes. Our eyes have a sensor for photons. That's how we are seeing things. That's photon, which is denoted by this Greek letter gamma here. There are other uh, carriers of forces which we don't see in our everyday experience because they're confined. They're, they don't um, exist in free state. Gluons are the agents that hold the nuclei together in a nucleus. Think about it, uh, 
everything except the hydrogen nucleus has multiple protons in it. Protons are positively charged and like charges repel each other, right? So how come they're uh, held together in this, the nuclei? It's the gluons. Their binding forces overcomes the uh, repulsive force of the photon. There are two others, W and Z bosons. These are responsible for uh, weak nuclear forces that cause transmutation of matter. And were it not for them, we would not exist because all the nuclear reactions, including those in the sun that is generating the energy to which we owe our existence, is um, mediated by these weak bosons. Also, the nuclear um, reactors that uh, generate electric energy here on Earth or nuclear bombs, they all uh, need this weak interaction. Now, the only thing that is left is the Higgs boson. Uh, this uh, picture is actually from before the discovery, so it says yet to be confirmed. Now we have confirmed it. And that is part of a story that explains why these fundamental particles have mass at all. None of these other things, these interactions required the particles to be massive. Yet, the particles, like the proton, the electron, they have some mass, and um, that is why the Higgs mechanism was needed. This is another picture uh, showing the same particles, and the, uh, I don't really want to go into the details of the values. What I want to show is, however, that from the lightest charged particle, which is the electron, to the heaviest, that is the top quark, it's a very large range of mass. And we better be able to explain it somehow. And that's where the Higgs comes in. To give a quick summary of what kind of interactions we know of, the two that, are, um, that we experience every day are, first of all, gravity. Obviously, that's, um, it affects everything. It has infinite range. Uh, and there's no neutralization. You cannot form a gravitationally bound system that will not have any gravity of its own. So Earth, uh, the sun holds the planets together in a planetary system, but the planetary system, the solar system itself, still has gravity. And it is dominant at larger scales. It's very weak at small scales. So yes, there is a um, gravitational force between, let's say, that uh, light hanging here and this light, but you cannot really measure it. It's not measurable at small scales, very weak. But at large scales in planetary or interplanetary, intergalactic scales, that's what dominates. The next one is the electromagnetic force. This only affects electrically charged particles. This also has infinite range. How do we know that? We are getting those photons from the galaxies and stars billions of light years away, right? It is. The photons are carrying electromagnetic force. So this also has infinite range. However, bound states are often neutral. So like the atom has positively charged nucleus, negatively charged electrons. But when they are come together, the net charge is 0. They cancel out. So the atom itself is electrically neutral. And it is prominent uh, it, at atomic scales, but also at stellar scales, uh, it plays an important role. The weak force affects all matter particles. It has extremely short, even subnuclear range. And it does not act as a binding force, unlike uh, electromagnetic force, which holds, uh, works as a binding force for atoms, or the gravitational force that's a binding force for the planetary system. The weak force is not a binding force. However, it is the only interaction that can cause transmutation of matter. That's how the sun is baking hydrogen nuclei into helium, and helium to uh, heavier nuclei still. And finally, the strong force, um, it affects only so-called colored objects. This color is not to be confused with the color that we see with our eyes, uh, but it's a quantum number that behaves in some ways to the visible colors and therefore the name. It's also of extremely short nuclear range, and it is dominant only at nuclear scales, so we don't uh, feel it in our everyday lives. Um, okay, moving on. Um, it turns out that the electromagnetic and the weak interaction forces are there. They seem different at today's energies, but if we go back in time, 
they unify at some point and act as a single force. Um, and it is postulated that other forces would also unify if we keep going at higher and higher energies. We have already reached the energy where electromagnetic and weak um, forces were predicted by theory to unify. Now this is very important. It was predicted by theory before we observed it. Usually it goes the other way. We do some experiment, we see something, the theorists go and try to explain what we saw. Here, as in the case of the Higgs boson, the theorists actually came up first. This should happen. Go look for it. We went and looked for it and found it. Shows the power of understanding and this is really um, extremely exhilarating experience when that happens. And there are many uh, aspects of physics that we uh, learn in high school through college uh, and university. There's mechanics that deals with, um, you know, apple falling on Sir Newton's head, um, electric and magnetic uh, interactions pioneered by Maxwell et al. Uh, then Einstein put them together in special relativity, then general relativity. There are this whole story about weak forces that got later combined with electromagnetism into electroweak theory and possibly there are further unifications uh, to be unveiled and uh, the string theorists, the string theory which is uh, purportedly the theory of everything uh, maybe someday will be verified. So uh, to summarize where we stand today, there's this standard model of particle physics where we have objects that are made up of mar matter particles. We also call them fermions. Interaction between these particles, the underlined uh, parts are important. You need two fermions to interact. These are mediated by so-called vector bosons like photon and gluon and stuff like that. They behave differently. And the bosons, they have some particle properties, but they're also exempt from certain number conservation laws. What does that mean? An object is made up of fermions, and those numbers are conserved. So if I put this object in my pocket, I would expect to find it there later on. I reach, out in my, uh, reach into my pocket, and it's still there. This is a property of fermions. With bosons, you cannot do that. I cannot grab a handful of light from here, put in my pocket and expect to find it there later, right? This does not surprise us. You flip the switch on and light starts streaming out of the bulb, right? Where is it coming from? It's not like switching a faucet on. That water was there somewhere else. It's just being channeled here. That light was not there. That light came into existence as a result of your flipping the switch. That it streams out of the light bulb doesn't surprise us. But if you flipped a switch and suddenly a baseball jumped out of the bulb, that would surprise us because matter doesn't get created or absorbed like that. Similarly, when the light hits the wall, a dark wall, and gets absorbed, that's perfectly natural to us. But you throw a baseball into a wall and the baseball disappears, that would surprise you a lot. So that's what, because a baseball is made up of fermions and the light is made of bosons. By the way, bosons can interact between, among themselves as well. Photons don't but other kinds of bosons do, uh, the gluons and the weak bosons. Also, just to complete the story, each particle has an antiparticle. The antiparticle of electron is a positron. You may have heard of this. Actually, the existence of positron was also postulated before its experimental discovery, one of the monumental um, achievement of physics by uh, Paul Dirac. And um, the bosons, like the photon, is its own antiparticle. There's no, well, photon is also the antiphoton. However, the fermions' antiparticles are distinct from each other. Now, all these interactions are between multiple particles. But the fundamental particles cannot acquire mass through these interactions. The interactions involve exchanging of bosons. And these are vector bosons, spin one, uh, technical term, don't need to understand. Uh, what it really means is that it has a directional property in space. So how do particles acquire mass? So these gentlemen, uh, Professor Higgs and Professor Engler and a uh, few others, came up with this theory independently that there's an omnipresent 
field. It's spin zero, has no directional preference, which pervades all space and gives mass to fermions and some of the bosons. The fundamental particles acquire mass by interacting with this field. No exchange of bosons. The field is everywhere. Just existing in this field gives mass to the particles. And a physical massive Higgs particle is a necessary consequence of the existence of this Higgs field. The Higgs boson doesn't give mass to particles. But the Higgs boson and the fact that the particles have mass owe their origin to the same uh, Higgs phenomenon, which comes from a Higgs field. I'll skip this. Now, how it kind of doesn't sound right that space contains something, right? We tend to think of outer space as empty, vacuum, right? But this theory says it's not so. Even empty space has some non-zero amount of this Higgs field. And how come? And that is because nature tends to roll towards the lowest available energy state. If I hold this uh, pointer here, it is at some energy state. If I release it, it'll try to fall to a lower energy state. Nature always does that. It turns out that the lowest energy state of nature actually corresponds to existence of this field. You would actually have to work in order to suck that out of nature. That's, you know, you can't even do that, but it's explained by this so-called Mexican hat thing. If you, um, if you put the particle at, uh, empty state, it would be at the top. If you let it go, it will actually settle somewhere where it has a non-zero vacuum expectation value. And that is what um, this ghost field of the Higgs that gives mass to the particles, gives a lot of mass to the top quark and a very little mass to the electron because there's something inherent in their nature. So this cartoon shows that the assistant dock catcher of York has walked into a room filled of people who are milling about in a cocktail hour, and he has caused no disturbance because the assistant dock catcher of York doesn't carry much fame or um, mass. So someone like that would be able to pass through this relatively crowded room unhindered, whereas someone a bit more famous like Sir Albert Einstein would immediately draw a lot of attention. People will, everyone will want his signature or shake hands with him, whatever, and he will face a lot of resistance, perhaps happily so, but it will, he will not be able to pass through the room as quickly as our previous gentleman. He has a lot of mass, so that would be like the top quark. And this room full of people, that's the Higgs field. By the way, you don't always need a person to draw this uh, crowd. Sometimes even just a rumor, hey, Einstein is coming, can cause people to mill about and start uh, talking about what they're going to do once this happens. And that is how the Higgs boson itself acquires mass. I'll skip through the few things and go, I've talked about the theory now. So experimentally, what do we do? This uh, particle accelerator, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, this is an aerial view of the, um, where the Large Hadron Collider is in Geneva. Uh, actually, it strides across the France-Switzerland border, which is shown here in, by this dotted line. This is the Geneva airport, and uh, the lab is located right here, which is um, actually pretty close, about uh, three and a half miles from the airport. And only uh, a very small part of it is on the Swiss side, but that happens to be also the, um, where the uh, CERN official campus is. And this tunnel is 27 kilometers, or about 17 miles around. It's huge. Goes underground, about on average 100 meters below ground, 100 meters, a little over 100 yards underground. and. Um, so it's, it's a very pretty place, actually. On a clear day, you can see Mont Blanc, uh, which is the highest peak in uh, Europe from the CERN campus. So schematically, this whole uh, ring 
is, um, it, this is not to scale. It's much bigger around than it is deep, but it's 100 meter below ground and uh, 27 kilometers around. Submachine parameters, it's uh, the length of it uh, is a little under 27 kilometers. The beam energy, each particle is injected at 450 billion electron volts. An electron volt is how much energy an electron would gain going through one volt of potential difference. Our average, uh, the AA battery has 1.5 volts between its two terminals. So uh, in or if you used um, those AA batteries, you would have to put um, 300 billion of them end to end to get, give this much energy to the protons. Of course, we don't use AA batteries, <laughs> but it gives you an idea of how, mu how much energy we are talking about. Uh, we need very strong magnetic fields, 8.33 uh, Tesla. These are some of the strongest magnetic fields that have ever been uh, created on Earth. There are only one, examples or one or two more that are stronger than this. Um, and those were designed to, um, for fusion reactor, different applications. But. And the operating temperature is 1.9 Kelvin. This is colder than anywhere else in the universe colder than outer space, created in, inside a lab. So where these uh, particles pass through, you have the coldest temperature anywhere in the universe. Lots of magnets, very um, high technology. This is stuff that has to be designed, built, tested, everything in-house. You cannot buy these things off the shelf at any store. And that explains why we need to invest so much to, and how, why it takes, uh, so much time to build these things. Uh, anyway, um, and the collision frequency at each point, so these uh, protons are made to go around the ring, two bunches opposite to each other, and then they can be made to collide at some point. Both are going in the same tunnel, just in opposite directions, and they can be made to collide by adjusting magnetic fields at predetermined points. And around those points, we make particle detectors, which are microscopes uh, of some sort, uh, cameras built into them, so you can take pictures. But you have to take, these collisions happen at 40 million times a second. So you really need a very fast camera to be about, <laughs> take pictures 40 million times a second. And we are talking about these detectors having more than 100 million channels, 100 megapixel camera. Now that may not sound too impressive, you can buy a 20 megapixel camera for a few hundred bucks um, online these days. But these are rather specialized cameras, not so simple as a digital camera. But the most important part is that taking 40 million pictures a second. Uh, your, uh, the, these cameras that you can buy might take maybe 10 or 12 at most. Here's uh, the camera that we are talking about, uh, the collaboration that I am a part of. This detector is built 100, 100 meters underground. It's uh, approximately 46 meters. That's the, about the length of an Olympic swimming pool and has a diameter of 25 meters. And here you see some uh, human figures to set the scale. And this big detector has elements that are microns, a few tens of microns in dimension and they have to be aligned also within microns. Trying to build this at this scale, 100 meters underground, uh, you cannot really build this thing on the surface and lower it. You cannot you know, dig that big a hole or arrange a crane to do that. So we actually have to lower the pieces underground and the cavern is very small. You literally work with your back on the wall and put these together so they're aligned within microns. This is. Uh, really a remarkable engineering feat. And here's a, a photograph of what the uh, central part looks like. These uh, things that look like the spider legs are actually uh, the toroidal magnets that create magnetic fields needed to detect particles passing through uh, that come out of the collision point. So what happens is the protons and uh, collides head on at very high energies and really hell breaks loose. I mean, all sorts of particles are created that didn't exist before from the energy of the collision, E equals mc squared, right? That energy can be converted into mass, new particles come into existence that didn't exist before and fly out at 
very, very high energies and this, the detectors are uh, like they surround the collision point. So you get a full solid angle, four pi view of the collision energy, miss nothing. As the particles are flying out, they leave uh, energy deposits in the medium. So they look, light up the detector and we connect the dots to reconstruct the collision event. This is another detector, uh, very similar in capabilities and purpose, just employing different technologies. And you always want to have multiple detectors because just to cross check and keep each other honest, also some healthy competition. Uh, if you see a new uh, phenomenon with one and not with the other, then you start suspecting that one of them is wrong. So they uh, offer very valuable cross check. Just, you know, when you have discovered something, you want an extra pair of eyes to verify that uh, you're not seeing uh, things, well, seeing things that don't exist. Uh, that's exactly what uh, the purpose is. Um, so this is a schematic diagram of uh, how particles passing through the detectors deposit energy and we can tell from the nature of the deposited energy what those particles were. So for example, if I shot a, I don't know, a handgun bullet versus a cannonball through the same wall, you would see the difference in damage they cause, right? So uh, that's pretty much how we tell one particle from another. And magnetic fields bend different particles differently. That's another handle. And um, here's a candidate event from ATLAS where a Higgs boson was created. Now, to discover the Higgs boson, you need two things. First, you have to create it with, by colliding particles at very high energy. And then you have to be able to see it. How do you see it? Well, uh, the Higgs particle being very heavy will, has many different options to decay into lighter particles. And this is a different kind of decay than the kind of decay of cabbage that we are used to. When a cabbage decays, it decays, it basically is just uh, falling apart, right? It, uh, it's not any, nothing new is being created. Whereas here, the decay is completely different thing. When a parent particle decays into two daughter particles, it's not, um, the parent particle simply ceases to exist and the daughter particles come about, they didn't exist before. This happens all the time in this kind of experiments. So the Higgs particle can create daughter particles that can create granddaughter particles and so forth. We have to detect them all and put the pieces of puzzles together to come up with what may have happened. By the way, one event is never enough to claim discovery that can have different interpretations. Only when you have a lot of them, then you say with some certainty or with some confidence that it did exist. Just like if we were looking for aliens, just one person with, uh, I don't know, pointy green ears and perhaps two short horns, uh, is it an alien? Maybe some uh, unusual mutation or something. But when you start seeing maybe a few dozens or hundreds of them, then you say, well, no, they are not humans. There's something else. It's like that. When we claim the discovery of a new particle, we need to have a certain number before we can say with any confidence that we are seeing something new. And this is one uh, candidate of the Higgs event where the Higgs decayed to two photons actually, the light particles, except they are so high energy that we won't be able to see it with our eyes. But uh, there they are. They show up in our detector as these two spikes. And when we put them together, which we can do uh, using the conservation of momentum laws, they come up at exactly where the Higgs mass should be. And we, um, this is from that particular decay modes, but we can, the Higgs particle has other options as well. And all of those um, point to this inescapable conclusion that there is something new at just over 125 GeV, uh, 125 billion volts. You can, this is a measure of energy, but because of E equals MC squared, C is the speed of light, it's a constant. So we, uh, in high energy physics, always talk about mass in terms of energy. We use the same units. You can just multiply, uh, divide this energy by the square of the speed of light and get the mass. So both the ATLAS experiment and CMS experiment see exactly the same thing. Uh, th the one here corresponds to what the theorists told us we should expect to see. And if it didn't exist, we would see zero. 
and both experiments see right at, so for other possible masses of Higgs like 110 GeV or 150 GeV, uh, 150 billion electron volts, the, what our data is consistent with zero. So the Higgs boson does not have those masses, but at 126 GeV, both experiments see exactly the predicted amount which is 1. So really, a, uh, by the way, what I am showing is the story from the discovery for which the uh, Nobel Prize was uh, awarded. So this was from July 2014, uh, uh, July 2012. Uh, by now we have gathered a lot more data and these things look even more dramatic. I am not talking about that because uh, this is supposed to be about the Nobel um, discovery. So both experiments uh, show a story consistent with the standard model predictions. Uh, of course, this was um, um, announced with due fanfare for the first time in its history, Physics Letters B, which is one of the most uh, prominent journals in the field, for the first time they put pictures on their cover. It is actually usually a dull blue color, always, uh, very understated. For the first time in its history, they uh, put the picture one each from the CMS and ATLAS experiments together with the photograph of the CERN and the um, CERN uh, uh, memento shop made good business selling these t-shirts. <laughs> so um, we have found something new, there is no doubt about that. Uh, is it the Higgs boson? Well, what can we say about that? It must be a boson that we know because a fermion cannot decay into two. Uh, photons. Um, it must be spin even, what that means is uh, Higgs is supposed to have spin 0, not spin 1. 1 is an odd number, so it has to be spin even because a spin odd boson also cannot decay into 2 photons. Um, higher spins are highly unlikely. Now we can say with fairly good certainty that it is a Higgs boson. How do we know that it is the Higgs boson? Actually standard model has room for only one Higgs boson but there are more ambitious theories and we know that standard model is not quite complete. It is very good. It has been extremely successful in explaining a lot of things that we do see but at the same time it comes up short in explaining some cosmological phenomena and we need a more general theory to accommodate those and some of those theories postulate multiple Higgs bosons. So it is possible that the one we see is one of many and that we do not know for sure yet. It seems you know, it is very consistent with the standard model prediction, but those subtle differences require more studies and that is exactly what we are doing right now. So uh, I will conclude with some final thoughts. Um, this discovery is a result really of decades of work by thousands of uh, people. Each of those uh, collaborations, Atlas and CMS have more than 3,000 collaborators now from uh, each country is, uh, each collaboration has more than 40 countries. From each country you have multiple institutions. From US alone, each of uh, the ATLAS experiment now has more than 600 US collaborators and the CMS has more than 800 US collaborators. As a single nation, US is the biggest participant in these, uh, either of these experiments. So uh, it truly is a great uh, achievement that um, compels us to push forth with even greater vigor. Uh, now the standard model scenario is complete. All the particles in the standard model have been experimentally verified, but we know that standard model is not the end of the story. There is more out there and we strive forth to um, look for those. Um, the LHC will operate for decades more, at least 20 more years. Uh, think of it like a powerful ship that has been sent out to explore. And we have only left shore two years ago. We still have 20 years of voyage in front of us. In these two years, we have found the last piece that was predicted to be out there. And we have verified its existence. What is beyond that, we do not know. Um, but we are confident that there is something out there. It would be extremely, um, it is extremely unlikely from theoretical arguments that there is nothing more to be discovered. But you have to 
actually sail and go there to see uh, what it is. So uh, one of my colleagues compared the particle physicists like ourselves as um, Columbus or the crew on their ship who's actually undertaking the voyage. But it has to be commissioned by the Ferdinands and Isabellas um, and funded, which in today's democracy are you. We do these experiments with taxpayer dollars. It's your money, it's your uh, voyage. And um, I hope you find it, the findings worthwhile. So actually we are talking also about uh, beyond the Large Hadron Colliders, other particle colliders with different purpose. So here you have a big exploratory ship. If it, if it has found something, then you might want to send a more targeted um, exploration boat to just go and check that thing out. So uh, you actually need uh, different kinds of particle colliders to complete these things. So those things are being contemplated as well. So my closing comment is that uh, I'll borrow words from a uh, wise man from yesteryears. Uh, this is not the end. It is not even the beginning of the end, but it is perhaps the end of the beginning. We have made a good stab at confirming the standard model and we need to keep pushing. Here's my team uh, from NIU. Uh, this picture was taken a couple of years ago with one of my colleagues couldn't be here in person. Actually, it's very difficult to catch everyone. They're scattered all over the world. Some people at CERN, some at Argonne. This uh, one time we had a meeting where most were present at NIU. Um, and okay, so we have some graduate students there as well. So these two people have uh, graduated already. Uh, others are professors and research scientists. And uh, I took a lot longer than the half an hour allocated to me, but it's such a long story, uh, hard to concentrate it. But I uh, thank you for your attention. And if you have any questions, please do ask. Okay, um, so I'm asked to repeat the question. The question is uh, actually on the title side slide. What do, uh, how does the Higgs boson matter? And thank you, thank you, thank you for ans asking this question because I didn't have an, enough time to go into this without being asked and I was desperately hoping that somebody would ask it. But I would have to ask myself if you didn't. Um, so yeah, it, it's basic science and one could say pursuit of knowledge for knowledge's sake. Whether that's a um, worthwhile thing to do or not, Setting that question completely aside, what is the utility of this kind of research? How does it enrich our everyday lives? And the answer is, it is um, impossible to overstate its importance. The, the experiments that we do, as I said, almost none of this can be uh, just bought on the shelf from the uh, detector elements that is completely, we need new technologies. Uh, really there is nothing out there that can deliver the kind of performance that we need to do our research. So it has to be developed in the lab from uh, the hardware uh, of the material that will be used to build the detectors to how those are read out, the electronics, um, how the data is to be uh, interpreted the software, I could go on and on, the, the lowest temperatures, the 1.9 degree Kelvin that doesn't exist in the universe. No one in, at least in the civilian world that we know of, is capable of making such low temperatures, the superconducting magnets and so forth. All of these things are absolutely needed for our research. So we devise these things, we uh, get the technology to discover the Higgs boson, but once that is done, you invariably find these technologies useful in many other walks of life, be it uh, you know, healthcare to homeland security, information technology, even financial markets. M most of our graduates, um, very few of our graduates actually end up becoming researchers and professors down the road. If you can, as a simple math, there's only so many positions open, so only about 5% or so stay in the field. The rest go out in other fields, and these fields include all of these that I 
said, some become medical physicists, some um, IT professionals. And there's a huge demand for these people on the Wall Street because they know how to interpret data, do pattern recognitions, and you know can see the uh, trends that is so uh, important on the Wall Street. Just to give you a few technological examples, the World Wide Web, guess where that was developed? At CERN, the Large Hadron Collider. Did you know that? And because it was developed with taxpayer money, you don't have to pay a cent each time you click on a link. Had it been developed privately by Microsoft or Oracle or Google, whoever, you would be paying for every click. And you would not be clicking, actually. It would not have come to this state that it is now. Agreed that when it was developed, the uh, inventor had not seen the application that we see today. It was actually done so physicists could share their uh, papers and results easily, electronically. And look what it has become useful for. But it's, it's the technology that we are talking about. Its application is quite another thing. I talked about every particle having its antiparticle. And we have to detect uh, these particles. How many have heard about uh, PET as uh, uh, cancer or tumor uh, imaging technique? No one? <laughs> it's called positron emission tomography that um, actually um, makes radioactive um, nuclei of carbon that give off positrons. Positron annihilate with electrons. Particles and antiparticles, when they come together, they annihilate into a flash of light. Actually, they send two photons back to back. And these two photons, with each with energy equivalent to an electron's mass, are detected using our detector technology. So positron emission tomography, which is now widely used to uh, detect tumors and uh, uh, yeah, malignant growth, is uh, the ideas and the technologies come from high energy physics. The MRI uh, needs magnetic field, strong superconducting magnetic field that we develop to use magnets that we need to steer the beam. Um, uh, ways to detect photons to see light, very, very faint light signals that we need because the particles are uh, sometimes leave very faint signals. That can be used for night vision. So if you want to stop uh, smuggling across the border or uh, you know, illegal immigration, whatever, you use uh, night vision goggles that can use our technology. If somebody is trying to sneak in radioactive uh, bomb making material, our particle detectors technology can be used to detect those things. Um, there are a number of uh, others. Uh, the superconducting technology makes for efficient storage of electricity. So you know, storing power is actually a big uh, challenge these days. If you use conventional wires, they heat up, and a lot of power is just wasted in this uh, process, just dissipates its heat. With superconducting coils, you can store energy without any loss. Again, something that comes from physics. And all of these things are for free. We don't hold patent on this. We don't make a, uh, any uh, money because they are funded by taxpayer dollars. They're all yours for free. Um, so I, I think, I mean, if you add it all up, it returns your investment hundreds of times over. No exaggeration just if you count the dollars and cents. Forget about the pursuit of knowledge, which is what I do it for and many others do. And you know, some people think it's worthwhile. Some may disagree. But even if you just count the financial uh, aspect of it, how does it affect my life on an everyday basis? How does it enrich it? How does it allow me to uh, live a longer, healthier, happier life? I think it, it does. Uh, contribute a lot to that as well. Thanks again for asking this. Another question? Oh, uh, sorry, if I can yeah. add one more thing to that. One thing that I think cannot be um, overemphasized is the training of the next generation that we do. 
of the and, and to me just to be able to do this it it is inspiring right when uh, a mountaineer scales mount everest or some other hard mountain or goes to the deepest of the ocean i'm not going to do that i'm not a mountaineer i know i'm never going to do that but it still makes me proud as being a human being that a fellow human being has achieved it that this is doable it inspires me to do whatever i do a little bit better and i think that's a very important message for the next generation that that this challenge can be met and i'll do better so i hope the students that are in my class today will be inspired to to you know take that leap and do better than i did and the next generation will do even better and that's how we evolve uh, into a better and better society. That should not be underestimated. Sorry. Uh, why did you choose to study engineering rather than uh, biology? The Higgs boson sometimes referred to as a God particle. Where did that name come from and why did you do it? Okay, so the question is uh, why does the Higgs boson uh, often referred to as the God particle, what is the source and uh, I guess what's my comment on that? So uh, the Higgs boson was dubbed God particle by Leon Letterman who's uh, an ex-director of Fermilab, still lives here I believe, um, who's a very accomplished physicist, uh, a Nobel laureate himself, but I kind of I'm not with him in naming that God particle. Well, of course, it's a catchy name. Uh, sold a lot of his copies of his books by naming it that. Um, I think the idea behind that was that Higgs boson, like God, is ever present everywhere. Um, and it is also one of its kind. So all the other particles that I showed belong to a family. So there are many like them. Each is in a class or category that's shared, uh, that it shares with others. Higgs, on the other hand, at least in the standard model, is one, one of its kind. There are other theories which says there are multiple Higgs bosons, but let's not go there. Uh, in writing that book, uh, Professor Letterman was assuming that there's only one. So that and the fact that it's everywhere and without it the world could not exist as we know it is the reason it's called the God particle. Having said that, I would rather that he didn't call it that. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, there, there was a, okay, sorry. So, once we developed a better understanding of atoms and molecules, we began engineering them and creating new substances, eventually creating in labs new types of. Uh, Um, okay, so the question is, uh, now that we have created the Higgs boson, is there any prospect of actually using it to um, putting it to some application? Um, by the way, uh, before I come to that, answer that question, let me also note that when we say Higgs boson, there's another person's name associated. Uh, there's of course a Peter Higgs, but the boson is named after Satyendranath Bose, who is the, after whom the class boson is uh, named. So he came up with the theoretical uh, description of the class of particles that are called bosons together with Einstein. So it was, it's Bose-Einstein statistics that describes the behavior of the bosons. Uh, and the fermions are named name after Enrico Fermi, Oh, the same person after whom Fermilab is named, that is Fermi-Dirac statistics. So the two of them had um, formulated the statistics that fermions obey. And this Bose is, um, I went to the same high school as he did, of course, many years apart. I never saw him, but uh, there's a bust uh, on the school lobby that I walked in front of several times a day. And uh, that inspired me to take up this field to <laughs> answer your question, and I hope that can continue. So after that aside, 
Um, the Higgs boson itself, we will not be able to exploit as the particle because it lives an extremely short period of time between its coming into existence and disappearing into uh, other particles. The time is only on the order of 10 to the power minus 24 seconds. That's a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. Even light does not travel very far in that time. So we are not going to have, uh, you know, be able to use Higgs bosons to uh, cure cancer or AIDS or, you know, make up some fancy material. Uh, actually, th so there's this saying when uh, I think it was Max, I think it was Maxwell who was asked um, by a uh, British parliamentarian. So what is the use of electrons that you have discovered? And the answer was that I don't know what the use is, but I can guarantee you that in 10 years you'll be taxing it, <laughs> electricity. And sure enough, uh, they were. Unfortunately, I cannot say the same thing about Higgs bosons. And the reason is electri electrons, the carrier of electricity, that was a stable particle. Electron stays an electron. It doesn't decay into anything else. It's the lightest of its kind. It cannot decay into anything else. Everything else that came after uh, electron and proton and neutron are heavier states. We call them uh, either heavier states or excited states that tend to de-excite or decay into lower states. So all the other quarks, the charm quark, the W boson, the Z boson, top quark, bottom quark, and the Higgs boson, these are, excuse me, highly, highly unstable particles. So they, they don't, they exist for a very fleeting instant of time, too short to be exploited, to be made use of, to make something. But as I said, uh, you, and also they are so difficult to make. You really have to collide particles trillions of times to make one of these. So they cannot be produced en masse in enough quantities and stored to do anything, you know, to make something out of Higgs bosons. But the technology and the knowledge gained from um, making creation of Higgs bosons possible, that goes a long way in improving our everyday lives, as I gave some examples of. We have a question over here. Is there anybody over there that's been missing? I really appreciate your uh, analogy there of the room full of people as the boson field, I guess, or a Higgs field. So if I understand you, you're saying that even in the deepest space where there's nothing but void, there, there, that's a Higgs field out there. Mm -hmm. And so what makes matter appear to pass through those spaces are when fermions pass through there. Yeah. So um, you mentioned string theory, and I wondered if the people who predicted the existence of the Higgs boson was were they string theorists? And can you explain a little bit to the layman like myself what string theory is? Um, okay. So the question is um, the Higgs boson, which permeates all space um, and gives mass to particles, including fermions, uh, is it? predicted by string theory, uh, by the same people who postulated uh, the existence of the Higgs boson, and uh, in layman's term, what string theory is. So, uh, no, the uh, Higgs, Angler, and others who uh, hypothesized the, uh, this field were not string theorists. String theory came after, but string theory being the theory of everything, does, in a sense, not only explain, not only accommodate, but actually predict uh, all kinds of particles that we see, fermions, bosons, even things that we haven't seen yet. Uh, as far as string theory goes, I'm well nigh a layman myself. It's, there's the question whether it's uh, mathematics or physics. Physics is something that you can verify with experiential observation. So if there's something that we are never going to be able to experimentally verify, that's math, that is not connected to a physical reality. And as far as things stand now, string theory uh, is not within um, foreseeable future going to be verified or refuted by experiment. 
its predictions are such that um, we are orders of magnitude away from proving or disproving it. So at this time, I would treat it as more math than physics. That said, yes, string theory does accommodate uh, Higgs and much more. In really layman's terms, strings are uh, what to call them? It's not even object. Um, they're phenomena which you can associate vibrations in multi-dimensional space. So we live in three-dimensional regular space, right? In which length, width, and height describe our x, y, and z three directions perpendicular to each other. You can add time as a dimension to it. Time is a dimension, but it is different from these three dimensions. The geometry and time dimension is different. So if you have add time as a dimension, Pythagoras theorem will look quite different. Um, so four dimensions, including time. The strings live in 11 dimensional space. So you have to add seven more to it. And those dimensions are entirely different from these four. Some of them may be closed, looping back on uh, themselves, and things like that. And these entities in those high dimensional space, they can vibrate at different frequencies, much like you know, the strings on your guitar can vibrate at different frequencies. And different modes of frequencies correspond to different physical particles. Um, why there are certain frequencies, how they would give different masses to different particles are all explained very satisfactorily within the string theory. The trouble is experimental verification because to see those dimensions, you have to go to energy scales. They're way beyond our today's capabilities. It may be that some of those have implications that may be verifiable, but it's still very far from direct full proof. So if you see a, uh, let's say, one strand of hair that doesn't fit any of the animals that we know, maybe from a new species of animal, that much we can say, but to give the, you know, have a detailed description of the full animal from that is quite different, difficult. Speaking of uh, Higgs field, I'm still a little bit unclear as to how that actually provides mass. I, I got the analogy mm -hmm. of things blobbing on top of the part that uh, fermions are going through, but is it because the, the objects that make up the field, those intrinsically have some minuscule mass to them, or what is it that actually gives the mass? Okay. The question is, how does the Higgs field impart mass to particles? Um, And so actually the Higgs field imparts mass to different particles in different ways. To fermions, it imparts mass by just having some strength of interaction. There are some bosons, the W and Z bosons, which acquire mass in a different way by uh, interacting with the Higgs fields. So um, they were trying to explain how the uh, W and Z bosons have masses. And this particular mechanism gave a satisfactory answer to that. And then. Uh, it turns out that you can just say that the fermions couple with this Higgs field with different strengths and therefore acquired their mass. This is a little bit aesthetically unpleasant, if you will, because it still has that arbitrariness. Why should it, will, should it be one number for the electron and another number for the up quark? But a standard model accepts it as, hey, that's how it is. Um, there are some other theories, including the string theory, that explains how it is but it's hard to verify. But the um, Higgs field actually, if you will, polarizes space in a certain way. I say this in a very loose term and I'm well, on the border of lying, uh, but I, can, I don't know how to simplify it better. It does not polarize in the space that we live in, but it polarizes in an internal space that's called isospin, weak isospin. So these Higgs, uh, the Higgs field carries a non-zero weak isospin. And that's why any particle that carries weak isospin, that includes the fermions, couples with the Higgs fields and acquires mass. Only the particles that do not carry weak isospin, namely the photon and the gluons, are massless. And this we know. Photons are massless indeed, right? Uh, they don't have any rest mass. Um, photons and gluons are the only two particles that do not carry any weak isospin, which is 
an internal space and it's kind of hard to describe what it is. Uh, like maybe for a human it would be an internal spiritual space. Um, every particle has its internal space. Some of them have weak isospin, some of them don't. Because the Higgs field itself has weak isospin, if a particle has weak isospin, they will couple and a mass will result. That's how the exact mechanism is different between fermions and bosons, but only particles that do not carry any weak isospin in their internal space can be massless. Photons and gluons are the only two instances of those that we know of so far. During, this is a very narrow question. During your presentation, you mentioned neutrinos and how it's fascinating how they just go through matter without having any effect. But you also referred to the fact that sometimes they do have effect or they. Yeah. And I'd just like to know what it looks like when they do or what mm -hmm. it is that happens. Excellent question. So the question is uh, there are these quote, ghostly, unquote, uh, particles called neutrinos that pass through regular matter unhindered most of the time because they interact very weakly. But every once in a very rare occasion, they do interact. So the question is, how do they interact? So the neutrinos are the only fundamental fermions that do not carry any electric charge. So they're free of electromagnetic interactions. They only participate in weak interactions, which is because of this weak isospin. They carry a non-zero weak isospin. Until recently, it was thought that maybe uh, neutrinos are massless, but now we know that they do have some non-zero mass. They're extremely small, but not zero, the mass. Now, because they do not interact electromagnetically, which is a stronger force than the weak force, and they do not uh, interact by the strong nuclear force either, they really do not see the existence of these charges. So when they pass through uh, an atom made of electrons and protons, they're completely immune to their electric field. They will not be deflected, they will not be scattered, they will not be attracted, nothing. They will just pass through. However, the weak interaction, weak but non-zero it is, every now and then it's an extremely short range force. It's so short range that the neutrino will almost always miss that. But, excuse me, once in a blue moon, it will hit it head on enough to be affected by that um, interaction. And when that happens, it will just transfer some of its momentum to what it is hitting. And we will see the recoiling system, which could be a proton or an electron, something electrically charged, because when an electrically charged object recoils, it creates a magnetic field around it and we can measure that magnetic field. Or sometimes it emits light, we can see that light. So because the rate of interaction is so rare, you really have to be, build huge detectors. By huge, I mean like a big building. Fill it with transparent material, water or oil or something like that. Water is difficult to keep transparent, you know. Things tend to grow in water. No matter how pure you make it, It'll grow algae and soon become uh, turbid. So, and then you just wait there for days and weeks and months for one of these interactions to happen. You, so then these neutrino experiments look like huge caverns filled with ultra, ultra pure water. And the entire wall is instrumented with very, very sensitive photodetectors. You have photodetectors this big that can detect a single photon. I mean, when you're looking at the screens, your eye is receiving millions of photons. That's how much you need to see it. You would not see anything if a single photon bounced off here. Our eyes are not sensitive enough. So we have these big photo detectors. Each of them costs thousands of dollars, lining the entire uh, inside wall of a cavern filled with ultra-pure water. And scientists sitting there and every once in a blue moon seeing a signal, quite opposite from what we do at LHC, 40 million interactions per second. Uh, but you do see and they do follow the uh, theory well enough by 
watching these carefully enough and long enough, you gather enough statistics and we are very confident. In fact, the weak and the electromagnetic force, now the electroweak force, is the most precise theory that we have. Some of the calculations hold to like 20 decimal places, at 20 uh, significant figures. So these theories are good to a part in a billion trillion. That's how good your prediction is. You can theoretically calculate, make the measurement, they will agree in one part in one billion trillion. Okay, so the question is, um, does the Higgs boson have any bearing on the gravity? Might it be uh, possible to explain gravitational interaction using the Higgs mechanism? And uh, the second part is, if the universe stopped expanding, would gravity cease to exist? Yeah, exist. Will it change uh, its form? Okay, so the first part, the short answer is no. Um, gravity, by the way, is the one force that is not for which we don't have a quantum description yet. It's, I'm sorry, this might be important. Hello? I'll call you after it's done, it might be a little while. Sorry. Okay. 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 I'll call. Okay. Bye. Thanks. Sorry, it was somewhat important. Um, sorry, where was I? Oh, yeah. So the short answer is no. Uh, gravity is the only force for which we don't have a quantum uh, description yet. And that is um, because it is so weak at short mm -hmm. distances. It's very difficult to make measurements at short distances. It's still a geometric theory, how it alters the space-time geometry. And this is um, formulated by Einstein and very successful in describing uh, observations or explaining the observations so far. The reason um, it is not, uh, the Higgs mechanism will not be able to give a quantum description of gravity is because uh, gravity is again an interaction between bodies, whereas the Higgs mechanism is really how uh, individual par particles acquire mass, not uh, as a means of interaction. So the two are in completely different domains. Uh, as to your second question, whether uh, if universe stops expanding, uh, will gravity change? Um, well, the universe is not going to stop expanding. Uh, we, we now are confident in saying that. Uh, so the universe starting with a Big Bang. And so a lot of energy just throwing things apart. But gravity is an attractive force. So no matter what happens, these things that are going apart should be pulled back together by gravity. The question is, is it going to then reverse at some point and, you know, things will fall back under gravity and the universe ends in a big crunch? Um, that was a scenario. That depends on how much the initial energy was. If it was extremely large, too much for gravity to pull everything back in, then things would never fall back. On the other hand, if it wasn't enough, it would go to some distance and then fall back. But Actually, we were being oversimplistic in thinking that. It turns out now that there is the thing called dark energy, which tends to expand. The universe is not only expanding, but it's expanding at an accelerated rate, which doesn't make sense. If gravity is the largest, uh, is the only force dominating at large distances, it will only slow the expansion down. Whether it's enough to bring it back together is another question, but it should at least slow it down. But experimental observation now definitely shows that the universe is not only expanding, but it is expanding faster today than it was doing a billion years ago. And that really confounds, and the only way to expand that, uh, to explain that is through uh, what Einstein had in his, his uh, equation for uh, general relativity, the cosmological constant, which he suppressed because he didn't believe that the uh, universe could be 
expanding and later in his life he reckoned that that was the biggest mistake of his life. Um, but the cosmological constant is only a mathematical expression of that phenomenon. What causes it we don't know yet and but of the total energy content of today's universe the largest part is that dark energy about 73 percent. The kind of object that you and I are made of and the suns and the stars and the galaxies all of the enormous amount that I showed accounts for only 4 percent of the total energy of the universe. 20, another 23 percent or so is the so called dark matter which is matter it is not dark because no one is shining light on it or it is not glowing. It is by nature such that you can try to heat it as much as you want it is never going to glow it is not going to go hot. It is kind of neutrino kind of property but it is not neutrinos that we know. What it is we do not know yet and there is no candidate for it in the standard model but it is there we know it from its gravitational effect in fact because our galaxy is rotating and galaxies are rotating in such ways that could not be explained with the regular matter we call it baryonic matter that you and I are made of. There has to be at least five times as much of this dark matter in order to explain these cosmological observations. But even that is roughly a third of the dark energy content and this dark energy seems to be a property of space itself and this it is very hard to relate but it, what it means is that space left to itself will try to expand. Does not make much sense right how does space expand but that is what it is two points in space will tend to drift farther from each other left to themselves. It is a slow process takes a long time but as the universe grows older and older the amount of dark energy increases the total amount of energy in the universe is not conserved. Now do not take this to your classroom we learn in our classroom that energy is conserved and it is for all practical purposes everything we do on everyday life energy is conserved. But over the life of the universe it is not dark energy was a smaller fraction of the total energy content of the universe 10 billion years ago it will be a greater fraction 10 billion years later and the universe will expand at a faster and faster rate and uh, we will not live to see that state but 10 billion years, 100 billion years from now it will be a much colder, much sparser universe <laughs> totally dominated I mean it is already dominated but by that time uh, dark energy will account for almost all of universe's energy. So this dark energy uh, is weaker than even gravity on short time uh, short distance scales but on over large distance scale, st scales it actually overwhelms gravity and causes universe to expand at a faster ever faster rate overcoming the attractive nature of gravity. Any other questions over here? Yeah uh, there is one. I have one over here I'll be right back. Is there any concern that with these high energies and um, converting that energy into matter and especially with neutrinos that when we are throwing those out we are permanently spending um, energy we are permanently releasing information? Uh, can you repeat that question I did not fully get it. Is there any concern that with converting these high energies to matter mm -hmm. and throwing out matter especially, especially neutrinos that are going to continue on out um, is there any concern that we are permanently spending energy hmm. permanently spending information. Okay, um, so the question is we are uh, expending a lot of energy to make these particles collide and some of these are ending up as in creation of neutrinos and the neutrinos are escaping our detector in the world in the solar system. So is there any concern that we are permanently draining energy and um, losing or giving out information is that right? Um, the answer is yes but it is actually a very very small fraction of energy. So these trillion electron volts multiple trillion electron volts protons that are colliding trillion electron volt may sound uh, like a large number it is a large number for a proton but its energy is actually far less than the kinetic energy of a flying mosquito. Well, what is the big deal then? Well the big deal is 
imparting that much energy to something as tiny as a proton that is challenging but um, all in all when two protons collide and they um, annihilate and even all of that energy goes to neutrinos compared to the energy that we are spending during this talk in the form of light and everything it's very small so yes uh, neutrinos are escaping they are draining energy but it's it's such a minuscule amount that it's not uh, nothing to worry about in terms of losing energy as for information being carried away they contain information but extracting any information from neutrinos is well nigh impossible I mean no matter how much smarter an extraterrestrial uh, civilization may be it's unimaginable that they'll be able to use it for any purpose friendly or otherwise uh, it's I, I don't think there's any real worry co about that Um, the question is uh, with the dark energy causing the expansion of the universe does the Higgs boson uh, expand with it the Higgs boson itself is a particle that is extremely short-lived it's a point-like entity so it's point-like and short-lived so it does not the concept of expansion doesn't apply to it however the Higgs field which permeates all of universe and the universe is expanding because of dark energy the Higgs field will uh, continue to uh, occupy all space and um, it does not take away energy because it is the lowest energy state of uh, the universe so as universe expands uh, it will continue to be occupied by Higgs field but if you think about try to think about it that it's a given amount of Higgs field that will increasingly become diluted because the volume is increasing it's not like that I mean we like to think ab about that like some amount of gas if we expanding it's a low but it, the gas is fermions and Higgs boson or the Higgs field is a bosonic field the same concepts don't really apply well thank you very much if there are no questions